So I bought one of these smart Bluetooth Rubik's Cubes online for a little bit over £10. Now if you've not seen these before, this is like a regular Rubik's Cube, except it has tiny sensors inside it which detect uh, when you rotate any of the sides. And it comes with a companion app that you run on your mobile phone which tracks the state of the puzzle. And it comes with a little solver that tells you what moves you have to do and things like that. Now, I knew that the Cube communicated with the mobile phone app through Bluetooth. So I thought, well, in that case, maybe it's possible to intercept that Bluetooth data on another device, uh, like this ESP32 up here, for example. And if I could do that, then I could use this Rubik's Cube as a, an input controller for uh, any kind of number of arbitrary devices. So for example, I could uh, twist this side here and it would make my lights dim. Or maybe this one at the bottom would make the volume of my speakers go up or down. Or in an escape room, if players solved the cube or solved one side of the cube, perhaps it could unlock a maglock and open access to the next area of the room or something like that. So it turned out it actually wasn't that hard to do. And in this video, I'm going to show you how I did it. Now on the board behind me, I've got an ESP32. And that's actually the only piece of hardware you need to make this work. Um, the reason I'm using an ESP32 rather than an Arduino in this case is that the Rubik's Cube broadcasts its data over Bluetooth and the ESP32 has a Bluetooth module built into it. Now, you can get Bluetooth modules for Arduinos as well. Um, there's a very common one called an HCO5, but that only uses what's called Bluetooth Classic or Bluetooth 2.0. Um, the Rubik's Cube I've got here uses Bluetooth Low Energy or Bluetooth 4.0. So you need a device that's capable of supporting that protocol, which the ESP32 does. Now, I've also got it wired up to a relay down the bottom here, which is controlling this 12 volt power supply to a maglock that's holding onto this blue. Because the thing is, I'm not actually very good at Rubik's Cubes. So if I managed to solve this one successfully, I thought it would be nice to celebrate. Uh, so what's going to happen is if the uh, ESP32 detects that I've solved this, it's going to activate the relay, which will release the maglock, and the balloon will be, uh, you know, a congratulatory balloon will be emitted into the sky. That's the idea, at least, anyway. But before we get on to that, let me show you the serial monitor output of what the ESP32 sketch is doing. And now if I just press the uh, enable button, so we're just going to restart the ESP32. You'll see there's quite a lot of information comes up on the screen there. I've made the code relatively verbose. So the way that Bluetooth LE works is uh, that a device like this, a server, advertises various services that it has available. And then a client like the ESP32 can kind of scan all those different services and uh, services can contain one or more characteristics as well. So characteristics are a bit like a, a variable, for example, in code. So what the ESP32 done there is it's scanned for a server that has the matching MAC address that we're looking for. That knows that that lets it know that it's communicating with the queue. Then it looks through the services that are available and it's done what's called a, a notification of the characteristic of one of those services. And that characteristic contains the data of the state of the puzzle. So every time I now move this, what will happen is because we've set up that notification, a callback message gets triggered on the ESP32. And in the sketch there, what I've got is I've got it printing out what the contents of the characteristic now are. So every time that characteristic changes, it's like a variable that changes. And I'm going to print out what the new value of that variable is. So the first bytes that I've displayed across the screen there, they describe uh, the position and the orientation of the corners of the cube. And then the next bytes after that, they describe the position and orientation of the edge pieces of the cube. And then we've got a couple of bytes after that that actually describe the last move that was made. So I can tell whether the, uh, the base was rotated, whether the right side or the left side was rotated, or the top, or the front, or the back, and which way that they were. And by comparing that string of byte values that describe the state, I can actually 
work out the entire state of all of the pieces on the cube at any one time. Now, um, I'm just monitoring for a particular state there, which is the solution state, and that's where that string there reads uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, AB, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, AB, etc. So if I'm able to solve the cube, which hopefully I can do, so I'm going to do there, when I twist this final uh, rotation at the bottom here, the code will recognize that state. It's going to uh, release the mag lock via this relay here, and we'll have a congratulatory balloon. Let's see what happens. Are you ready? Here we go. Well, that went about as well as I was hoping, actually. That's pretty good. Here's the code. So even though the ESP32 isn't technically an Arduino device, um, I'm still programming it using the Arduino IDE. Um, so, you know, the language looks the same. You can include many of the same libraries. Um, all you need to do is come into File Preferences and uh, include this package here. That's going to download the definitions of the different ESP32 boards available. Um, and then before you upload it, uh, you come to the Tools menu and select the corresponding board. You can actually see there's several different uh, ESP32 boards here. So you just select the one that matches the particular device that you've got. Uh, mine is a Node32S. Um, and then from then on, you can treat this just as if you were programming any other sort of Arduino. Um, so there's quite a lot of code here. Some of that is because I've put in a lot of comments. I've tried to make it um, kind of self-documenting as much as possible, but I will just step through it to explain what's going on here. So we start with by including this library here. This is actually part of the ESP32 library itself, so you don't need to do any additional downloads for this, but this just states that we want to use the Bluetooth LE features of the ESP32 library. Um, and then we define some constants at the top of the code. So some Bluetooth devices, when you kind of do a scan, advertise their name. So you might see something that says, you know, my smart speaker system or uh, the model name of your headphones that you connect to, things like that. The problem with the cube, which I'm using, it doesn't actually advertise a name at all. It just has a MAC address. So um, what I had to do is to find out what that MAC address was, I literally put uh, a Bluetooth scan on using my mobile phone, actually, but you could do this using um, any device, really. And, um, you know, you often find many two Bluetooth devices come up. If you twist one of the sides of the cube, that's what kind of what makes it wake up and start broadcasting. And at the point I twisted it, this was the new device that was found in my uh, Wi-Fi scan that wasn't there before. So that's kind of how I knew that this was the address that corresponded to the cube, was just from copying that down from my uh, mobile phone. Now, uh, if you then kind of poke around in that service, you try to connect to it, you can see with different services it advertises using a Bluetooth sniffer. And this is the uh, unique ID of the service that we want to connect to. And then this is the characteristic within this service that contains the state of the cube. There's other characteristics get broadcast as well. So, for example, I think the, the state of the battery, for example, the amount of battery life remaining is broadcast in a, a different characteristic. But uh, I'm not particularly bothered about that one. I just want to know uh, the state of the cube. So this is the characteristic. This is the service. And this is the MAC address of the device itself. So combined... Um, you will need to change this one in your code to match the MAC address of your particular device because that will be unique to every cube. But these two uh, should remain the same because they are the standard, assuming you're using the same manufacturer as me. And that seems to be shared a lot uh, in common between uh, different uh, manufacturer names. They actually all use the same service and characteristic ID. So you'll probably leave those the same. Uh, this bit I'll come back to in a bit, but uh, the data stream in newer models is actually encrypted, and this is the decryption key that we're going to we rely on a bit later on. So I'll come back to that. Here I've defined the byte that my uh, relay pin is connected to, so the GPIO pin. I'm using uh, pin 33, um, but again, this is kind of just, however, whatever action you want to take when the puzzle is solved, um, if you want to trigger a relay or something like that, you can change that to, to be something else. And finally, this is the, um, as I mentioned, this was the value that when the cube is solved, this is what 
the first 16 bytes of data we want to be equal to in the um, the characteristic that we receive. We only compare the first 16 bytes uh, because beyond that we have bytes that represent things like the last move made and we don't care what the last move made was to get to the solution we just want to know the actual state itself and that's contained just in the first 16 bytes. So that's there. Uh, we'll set up a couple of global variables just to keep track of what's going on. So the first one is have we actually found the device that we want to connect to? Then have we successfully connected to it? And then we'll actually create a couple of instances of objects as well. So this is the device and this is the characteristic. Uh, these data types here are all defined in that library which I included at the top here. Uh, BLE device, there we go. Okay, so we've got a couple of uh, helper functions as well. Um, so I've got get bit and get nibble. So while we receive a 20 byte array, there's actually more than 20 pieces of data in it. And the way that um, the cube achieves that is that there's several variables kind of packed into each byte. So if you just want to have an on or an off, well, that's a single bit and you can get eight bits in a byte. So if you want to have uh, eight different flags that indicate whether it's on or off, you can fit eight of them in a bit. And this function retrieves uh, an individual bit value uh, from a byte. Um, but there's also uh, a nibble. Now nibble is a, a less well-known data type, but that is equal to half a byte. Um, so you can store the values from 0 to 15 in a nibble and each byte can contain two nibbles. So this is a function that retrieves a half byte from a byte in that uh, array there. So that's just some helper functions. Now we get the callback functions. So uh, a lot of the way that this code works is based on what we call callbacks. So rather than uh, a polling method which is where you have a loop that goes over and over and kind of triggers something on a regular schedule, a callback is a function that is triggered when a certain action happens. Um, so we define sort of various callbacks that happen when different events happen basically. So the first one we've got is um, in our advertised device callback we have a function called onResult. So this is where we scan right at the beginning to find what Bluetooth devices are within range. And for every one that we uh, detect, this onResult function here is called. So this is the callback that's triggered whenever a uh, new device is detected. And what happens in that callback? Well, we um, first of all, we print what the uh, address of that device was that we found. And then we compare it to this p server address value um, which we defined at the top of the code here as the MAC address of the device we want to connect to. So we found something in range. What we're going to do is compare it to this value here to see what well, is it the cube basically. Like I said, if the cube actually transmitted a or if it broadcast a name as part of its advertisement, we could compare the name at this point to so say something like if advertised device dot get name equals um, Bluetooth cube, something like that. But my device at least, and probably yours, doesn't transmit a name. So we actually have to compare the address value instead. If that's equal, then we know we found the right device. So we can stop the scan. We don't need to look for any further devices. Uh, we can create the my device object based on what we found. And we'll say that uh, we'll set this flag to true. So we know we found it. And we'll just print some debug information. We found that we're connecting to the device. Um, if on result is called but the MAC address doesn't match, then we found some other device. So depending on whereabouts you are, if you're in a you know a busy cafe or if you're in the middle of nowhere, you might find anywhere from zero other Bluetooth devices to maybe 20 within range. Um, so we're just going to print out, but anything that doesn't match, we'll, we'll just move on by and say, okay, no, that wasn't the right device. We haven't found it. We've got some other callbacks as well. Uh, so these are client callbacks. So this is when we try to create a new client connection to the cube. We've got two methods here. The first one is called when that connection is successfully made. And the second one is when the connection is lost. Um, and for those two, you know, you could put a, a little print message there. But what we'll do is we'll just set 
the value of this flag to let us know whether we're currently connected to the cube or not. And we've got one more callback. This is the notify callback. So this is actually the, the most important one, as it were, because this is the one that gets triggered when that characteristic value changes. So uh, this uh, cube is advertising that it's got a service available, it's got a characteristic that's containing the data structure that describes the cube. And every time that changes, this callback is going to be triggered and it's actually going to be passed what the new value of the characteristic is as well. Okay, so let's see what this has happened. This is where really the, the most important part of the code comes. So the first bit, I mentioned earlier we had this decryption string at the top here. And this is where it's going to come in handy. In early versions of these Bluetooth cubes, the characteristic here was just a... Uh, an unencrypted data value. So um, when the cube was solved, if you were to just print out what the characteristic was at that point, it would look a bit like this. So it's all the corner pieces in order, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're all oriented the correct direction, which is what the three value means. So that means the, the up-down axis of the corner piece is aligned with the up-down axis of the cube itself. And then all the edge pieces are in the right place as well. So you could see very simply in this callback here uh, what the state of the cube was. However, newer cubes, including the one I'm using, now uh, encrypt this data string. I'm not quite sure why, because it's not exactly confidential data. But the problem is now you'll get a, a data string that looks something like that. And then you'll look at it again and it's changed to something like that, even though the state of the cube might be the same because it has a sort of a, a rotating key. So this is a little bit awkward. But fortunately, if you take enough readings, uh, because you can obviously see what the state of the cube is, you can physically look at it, and then you can look at the encrypted value that you are reading at that time. And if you get enough readings, it's actually pretty easy to crack this. So the first thing to note is that this penultimate value here, if that is equal to A7, that means that the code has been encrypted. In the earlier versions, you weren't getting an A7 there, you're getting some other value. So this is just a raw string, but when it's A7, you know it's been encrypted. So the first thing we'll do is we'll look for that byte. And if that's the case, then we need to do our decryption. So what we're then going to do is going to get the last byte of data, uh, which is this one here, and we're going to split it into two half bytes or two nibbles and we're going to use those as offsets into the decryption key. So for the first, uh, when it's encrypted, for the first byte of data in the encrypted key what we're going to look at is we're going to take the last byte, split it into two nibbles, then we're going to look up what the values were corresponding to those two nibbles in this uh, lookup key at the top and we're going to add them on to the um, the first element in the byte and then we're going to move through the whole string we're going to do that to every byte in the array so for the second byte we'll take whatever the um, the second will offset by one so we'll move through the key in each case we'll add on the key corresponding to the first nibble and the second nibble of that last byte and we'll add that onto the second byte and so on and so on. We loop through the entire key doing that and that will uh, decrypt it for us. So we've done all that and uh, so you didn't kind of see that happening in the code I showed you earlier, that was happening behind the scenes. What you saw was this bit here which is where we'll say okay we've decrypted the value if required, let's print out all of those bytes and then um, we'll look at the next two bytes, so after the state of the puzzle, the next two bytes represent the last move and the penultimate move. Again, it's split into two nibbles. So the first nibble tells us the face that was last move, and the second nibble of that byte tells us the direction it was moved in. So um, we'll split that byte into two nibbles, and uh, we'll look up. So this is the order. So if it's a, uh, a one, then it's front. If it's a 2, it's the bottom face. If it's a 3, it's the right face, top, left, back. So we'll print out what the last face to be moved was. 
and then if it's a one, that's a clockwise rotation, and I think you get a three for a anti-clockwise rotation, but either way, it's not a one. So we'll print out what that was. So this is the section of the code here. Let's say that you did want to do uh, one of those examples I described that says, you know, if you move the, the top face clockwise, that increases the brightness of lights, and if you move the top face anti-clockwise, it decreases it. This is the section of the code where you'd want to introduce that functionality. Um, so you could uh, say, you know, if the if the last moved face was equal to uh, 1, which is the front face, for example, and if the last moved direction was equal to 1, well, that's the front clockwise, then volume up or whatever. Uh, that's where you'd include it there. This uh, section here, but this is, the, this is the test which I'm doing in my code, and this is the test to see uh, whether the cube has been completed or not. So I'll use the, the memcomp function. So this compares the uh, values of two variables in memory. We're going to compare p data. Well, that was our now uh, decrypted string. So it got passed in as possibly an encrypted value, possibly not encrypted if it, uh, if it was an old format cube. We then went through this section here to decrypt it. And now I'm going to compare the first... 16 bytes of p data to solution, which is what we defined at the top here. Uh, so again, remember I said I only want to compare the first 16 values. I don't care what the last move was to get it to that state. I just want to know that it's in solution state. And if we compare those two and there's no difference between them, so that's equal to zero, I'm going to write a high value to the relay pin for 100 milliseconds, and then I'm going to write a low value again. So I'm using a, a fail secure maglock here so I just want to send a 100 millisecond pulse of high signal to it and then I'm going to cut off again. That's what uh, ejected the catch and that's what released my balloon uh, in the example here. But you, again you could do whatever you uh, wanted to in this section of code here. This is where you can write something when the cube is solved. Um, that's, that's the section of code you do that. Okay so there are all our callbacks. We've got the, um, the callback when we've found a device in range, the callback when we've connected or disconnected to a device, and then the callback when one of the characteristics has changed. Uh, now we've got a, a little bit more of the kind of the boilerplate code in terms of actually connecting to it in the first place. We've got a function called connector server, and we uh, instantiate uh, a, an instance of the BLE client, so this is called this create client method, um, and then assuming that's successful, will set those callbacks. So we need to tell the client about the callbacks we want it to call when those action happens. Uh, I mean, all these all these functions which I'm doing here are all standard functions that are defined in this interface here. So if you want more explanations of this, you can look up ESP32 Bluetooth LE examples um, that, and there's other code that uses very similar structure to this. So we'll create a client, we'll set the callbacks, um, we'll just print out what the, uh, the client address was and we'll connect to the client. And then once we've connected to the client, well, that's when we can interrogate it to find out what services it's got available. So we'll look for the service UUID, which we defined at the top. Uh, that was this one here. So again, you shouldn't need to change this. Uh, this is the service ID for these kind of cubes, as far as I can tell from all manufacturers. If we were able to uh, find that service, then it gets assigned to this variable here. If this fails to find the service, then uh, this value will be null. So that's what we do a test for here. We find out if the remote service is null, that means we couldn't find the service. So we'll just click failed. Um, if we have managed to find the device and connect to it and we found the service the next thing we do is we look for the characteristic within the service so having got our remote service object up here we now call the get characteristic method on that service using the uid again defined at the top and once again if that fails then we'll have a null value there um, otherwise it succeeds so we'll print done and then Finally, so we've got our device, we've got a service, we've got our characteristic. Now we're going to register for notifications of when that characteristic changes. So we'll check that the characteristic allows us to 
uh, register for notifications, that's what this can notify does. And if so, we will register for notifications. And when they happen, we're going to specify that we call that notify callback function that we were just looking at a moment ago. Um, if that fails, we'll print fails. If we get all the way to the bottom here, that means that all of our setup connection to the server was successful and we are ready to go. Um, here we've got uh, the function that scans for any Bluetooth devices in range. So again, we're using a built-in method of the uh, BLE library that's called getScan. Um, and when that scan finds a device, we'll get it to call the callback again, which we, we advertised at the top. Uh, and we'll just set the scan going for 30 seconds just to loop around and wait for any devices to come online. And finally, we get to the bits that might look more familiar to you. We, so as in all um, Arduino code, ESP32 code is exactly the same. We'll need a setup function that gets called when the program first runs and also a loop function that goes uh, round and round while it runs. So in setup, we'll initialize a serial connection uh, that will allow us to read all of these outputs that we've been uh, putting in the code above all of these serial or print lines and things like that will be sent to this serial connection at this board rate. We'll initialize the uh, BLE component of the ESP32 chips. That's what this init method does. And then um, this is our pin, which we're going to write a high value to when the cube is solved. So initialize it as an output with a low value to start with, um, because that's what's going to get written high if it's solved. And then in loop, loop is really nice and straightforward. So first of all, we'll check whether a device was found or not. So remember, devices found is uh, what is set by the advertising callback here. So we search for all advertised devices, and if they match the MAC address, that's how we know the correct device has been found. So if we've got the cube in range, and if we're not connected to it at the moment, then we'll try connecting to it. Uh, if the cube is not in range, then we'll call that scan for devices function, which was um, up here, uh, which is where it just searches for all devices in range. And uh, after that, all we'll do is we'll just do a little loop and then we'll go round and round and round. And that is all the code.